Thanks for having me. I've come down from Fort William, Scotland. I'd like to join you here in London. Um, weather's nice and dry here. Appreciate it. Um, my uh, accent's Canadian. I spent 25 years of my career with Moe. We used to be called Marine Harvest up until this year uh, in Canada. So that's the, uh, the accent that you hear. Um, for those that aren't familiar with aquaculture or salmon farming specifically, and I could have done a presentation on aquaculture, but salmon is my, my forte. Um, it, uh, it, salmon started in about uh, 1964, 1965. The Scots and the Norwegians argued about who did it first, but I think uh, between the Scots, the Americans, and, uh, and the Norwegians, it all kind of happened around the mid-60s. So 50 years of, of salmon farming, and just so you know, it takes about three years to grow a salmon from egg to harvest size, which is about five kilos. And if any of you are fishermen, five kilos is about that big, I would suggest. <coughs> so the company, Moe, we produce about uh, one-fifth of the world's production of salmon. You can see there in the regions where we produce it, our farming regions are Canada, Norway, uh, the UK, um, Ireland, and... Uh, also uh, the Faroe Islands. There is salmon farming down in Australia as well, but we just aren't active there. Uh, we're about 15,000 people that, uh, that raise salmon, uh, whether it's on freshwater hatcheries on land, and then they're moved into the ocean for the remaining two years of their life, and then they're processed and uh, sold all around the world. If you didn't know, uh, salmon and farm salmon from Scotland is the UK's largest food export. If you didn't know this fact, then I suggest you walked into the wrong conference. Um, <laughs> yes, we are surrounded by water, uh, much more water than land, but way, what you may not have known is that only 2% of our calorie intake comes from the ocean. So there's a lot of potential, obviously, for more calories to be produced out of the ocean. Uh, and we know, and we've seen a, a graph prior today, that the commercial fishery, the traditional fishery, has basically given us all it's going to give. The ocean doesn't produce any more. And in about 1988, uh, the discussion was much about uh, the ocean reaching its full capacity. And if you look at that graph, the dark blue being the traditional commercial fishery, that was <coughs> pretty spot on. Uh, I was in Canada, a lot of conversation then about the East Coast cod not giving us any more and, and actually being reduced in numbers. And you can see uh, that it's basically tapped out at about 85 to 90 million metric tons. Today, aquaculture surpasses that number, so we do more uh, than commercial fishery now produces. And that's just not salmon, that's seaweed, that's shellfish, that's many other species. And to put it in perspective, if we produce about 90 million metric tons of aquaculture seafood now, salmon, uh, we do about 2 million tons. So that's about 2, maybe 2.5% 2 of global aquaculture. Pangasius, if you know that fish, being one of the most popular aquaculture species. Um, but still significant, and, and significant in the countries where we produce salmon. So there's a real opportunity, and we all know this, the population is growing, fisheries are exploited, uh, climate change is changing what species we can grow. Some of it's a threat, some of it's actually an opportunity. Uh, there's a growing middle class in India and China that are wanted to eat, like us Westerners get to eat lots of protein, and seafood being a very healthy one. And we are generally living longer, so more people wanting that healthy seafood as well. Uh, aquaculture also meets many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we've highlighted 10 here that we think we offer um, a good solution for. I could talk about each of them, this is probably a presentation in itself, but I'll just highlight one and that is climate action. Um, salmon and fish specifically have the lowest carbon footprint of any animal protein that you'll eat. It's a very good news story that we're very careful with because I remember Oprah taking on the cattle farmers in America, and even Oprah got crushed by the cattle farmers. So, so we don't want to crush the, the sheep and the pigs and the, and the cattle, but we do want to point out that we're a, a very carbon-friendly protein source. The reason for that, if you didn't know, is because fish are cold-blooded, so they don't waste energy heating their bodies. 
uh, and they're also neutrally buoyant. They have a swim bladder, they don't have to fight gravity, so they don't build big bones that a farmer has to feed and then just throw away. So it's a very efficient food source. So, just back to where we were, and I'm going to move into the technology we, do, that we, uh, we use today. 1971, this picture was taken just west of Fort William in Loch Eilert on the way to Malik, if anybody knows that area. Um, they did figure out that they need to put the pen in the water, so that, that did get sorted. Uh, they're actually cleaning this pen, but you can see the structure back in 1971, and this farm proudly harvested 14 tons of salmon out of this cycle. A farm today will harvest over 3,000 tons of salmon, so things have changed quite a bit, and I'll show you that development. But this cage was made primarily of wood. It was a wooden cage. It was octagon shaped. Uh, they were taking it out of the water here to clean it. Um, it worked, but sites were sited uh, in places that were good for humans. So if it was close to a road, or close to a <coughs> processing plant, maybe close to a pub, it's a very good place to grow fish. Maybe, or a good place for people to grow fish, but maybe not best for the fish. So moving ahead about 20 years, you'll see uh, a site that is a mixture of wood and steel frames. And this really shows the evolution of not only my hair, I'm the guy on the right, um, I entered the business scuba diving, um, but it also shows the evolution of the system. You can see them getting larger, but it still is a steel system, it's square, uh, it's not very flexible in rough water, so you can see we're located close to the land there. This is, uh, everybody's been to Vancouver Island, this is the east coast of Vancouver Island near Campbell River on Quadra Island, actually. So, 2019, looking at today's modern <coughs> sites. This is actually a site located off the Isle of Rum in Scotland. was uh, put uh, in place last year. Looks very Norwegian <coughs> looking. Um, and this uh, really is today's farms, flexible, high dense uh, HDPE plastic um, that rides waves. Um, and we call this leading the blue revolution. We talked today, is it evolution or revolution? We want to speed things up um, in our technology, in our transparency. And uh, I think our company is quite good at exporting this knowledge and sharing this because as we say, Salmon is probably the most technological uh, aquaculture producer, um, and we want to help other countries and other species speed up their evolution and revolution as well. Um, because uh, I think when people speak about aquaculture, they would speak about the lowest common denominator. We want to make sure everybody comes up to a, a good level uh, playing field. So that was taken on a nice day. You don't send a drone up and take a, a picture on a crummy day, so I thought I'd uh, show you what it looks like on a, on a rough day. Uh, Kian's video was much more impressive with 17 meter waves, um, but this was taken uh, in the Outer Hebrides off the Isle of Barra uh, on a very rough day. And you can see how the, the cage is flexing and moving. Um, it's well anchored, obviously, and it did stay in place. Um, as a result of the storm, we do have four vacancies, so if anybody's looking for work, <laughs> So let me talk about siting first, and then I'm going to talk about specific technologies we use on the farm. Uh, obviously, uh, where we're located is important. We want to be in what we refer to as high energy areas, and that's always going to evolve for us. I'm sure back in 1971, that was a high energy area for the farmers that were there. On the Isle of Rum, we think that's high energy today. That's going to look a lot different in 20 years, I'm sure. We, of course, use big data, both uh, publicly available data and our own commission data to find the best possible location. So uh, between uh, you know, us in Canada, Norway, and, uh, and in Scotland, we have mapped a lot of the ocean that's never been mapped before. Um, it's not truly offshore. You can see on the left is land, but it's becoming further and further offshore, where farms typically now are a kilometer offshore, depending on the depth, of course. We also use uh, sensors to, uh, to, to make sure we've located the right place. We want to use sensors that uh, tell us about turbidity, salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, uh, and also algae. We've mapped a lot of algae blooms around the world too and can predict algae by using big data and, uh, and analyzing it over time. Uh, just last week, actually, I sent out a press release uh, that shows a graph of the last 10 years, uh, average temperatures in the ocean 
um, compared to 2019 where we saw a spike of about half a degree or degree pretty well throughout the year which had a significant impact on our fish health this summer. It's tough to keep salmon alive when algae is blooming um, but we have a lot of uh, temperature data throughout the coast of course. So moving from kind of sighting to what we do on the farm, uh, we take all this data and you can see here a control station um, that's, uh, that's in the middle of the farm. You can see the farm in, in the background uh, in the window. Um, and really what's most important for us is the health of our fish and how we feed our fish. Uh, it does take three years to grow a salmon. If you can speed that up a month, that's very good for business. Um, we don't do that with steroids or hormones, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Um, but to, uh, to achieve this, and, and, and what I've seen in the last 10 years, is uh, high definition cameras <coughs> and, and resolution underwater that's increased quite a bit, and I'll show you how that's improved our business. Uh, but here you can see one of the cameras that is monitoring fish feeding behavior, which will also beam in real-time temperature and salinity and oxygen and algae as well, and tell you if it's safe to feed your, fee uh, feed your fish, and if it is, at what depth you should be feeding your fish. So using those high-definition cameras, um, it can uh, now create pellet sensing. So we can sense the pellets, it can feed back to the system, and artificial intelligence will tell you when your feeding is done. Um, the idea, uh, of course, is because 60% of our operating costs are feed, we don't want to lose a pellet. Um, moving through that, uh, same technology, we can actually have facial recognition for fish. They do look different, apparently. Um, this, is, uh, this is a concept. This is not quite reality for us yet. But of course, all our, uh, to give you an example, each individual fish is given a vaccination uh, in the hatchery before it enters saltwater to protect it from naturally occurring diseases. So you can flash up a fish and identify which fish that is, which vaccination it's had, and what its health profile is. So looking forward to that. I won't get to enjoy this. I'll probably be retired by the time that comes through. But uh, one of the things, if you're living in the UK, that you might have heard about about our business is this little critter called sea lice. Uh, the sea louse is a little crustacean that lives on the skin of, uh, of marine fish. It's tiny. If you squish the tic-tac, that would be about the size of it. Uh, it's a tiny little parasite. It's natural, but it can cause us grief and cause damage on a fish. Uh, and uh, we want to control the levels on our farms. We can do that with fresh water. Sea lice don't live in fresh water. We can uh, also mechanically remove the sea lice, but one of the technologies coming through is laser. Uh, can actually find the sea lice, recognize the sea lice, and, and zap the sea lice. Uh, and that is being trialed now and, and is somewhat successful. And of course, ROVs are important to us. Uh, as a scuba diver, it's important that we, uh, we uh, increase safety. If we can see our farm, our farm is like an iceberg, of course. About 10% of it is what you see on the surface, and the rest is below. If we can send ROVs down, um, that is helpful. Uh, turning these technologies into concepts, uh, some of them real, like this one uh, that has been installed, uh, called the egg. We also have another one called the donut, which I want to show you. We seem to like food products when we name these concepts. But uh, this idea here is to uh, create a, a wall, uh, a semi-closed or contained wall to reduce the interaction between the outside and the inside, <coughs> protecting our fish and protecting the environment. Um, but anytime you do that and you increase your control of the water, you also increase your risk. So whereas in the ocean, the tides bring you in oxygen and clean water, here you rely on pumps to bring in that water. And if something goes wrong with that pumps, you may have seconds at best minutes to react before you start to lose your fish. Uh, and this is bringing the technology we have on land currently out to the ocean uh, and in, in increasing our control. Another concept here is uh, something called the Beck system. So uh, if anybody else scuba dives in the room, you'll know that it's always rough on the surface, but as soon as you get down, it's nice and calm and peaceful and serene. So if we can get out of the surface and get below, we can uh, increase our, our safety. Um, this particular system takes the pressure from outside, or the net, and, uh, and you can see a core that runs through the middle, so you're anchoring to the core of the system. So that's taking all the force under the ocean. 
So that's a bit of technology. That's a bit of, uh, of, of the systems that uh, either are in place or we're dreaming of. We do have one concept that I'm going to show you now uh, as a video, and it wraps up a bit of the technology that I've talked about and a bit of where we might want to go in the future. Um, and then my presentation is done. It seems to be a presentation of finishing with a, a big video. So uh, I'll leave this to you here. Human population has been rising significantly along with life expectancy. More food must be produced to sustain this population increase. The United Nations have clearly stated that the oceans will be vital to secure the growth in food supply. Sustainable aquaculture gives life and prosperity to coastal economies. It provides new opportunities, secures jobs and offers a high quality product. In Norway alone, the ambition is a five-fold sustainable growth of the aquaculture sector by 2050. <coughs> in Norway, we want to reach this goal by combining our best competence within the aquaculture, subsea and offshore industries. Collaboration is well on its way, and results will be both spectacular and transformative. Aquastore will grow salmon in its natural environment down in the protected depths of the ocean. Just a few miles from land, we have all the space in the world. Our pens are held at least 15 meters below the surface by powerful tailor-made and smart subsea winch systems, regulating depth autonomously. At greater depths, our salmon are protected from rough weather, waterborne pathogens and sea ice. The pens are all connected to a central hub, which distributes feed, air, power and signals to all safety functions from the Aqua Storm Land Control Center miles away. Feed is transported in pipelines and rises on the seabed, where waste is also retrieved from the pens for processing on land. The control center and adjoining infrastructure will supply several farming centers connected as clusters, making optimal use of the subsea infrastructure. Aquastore will utilize cutting-edge technologies that make salmon farming even more sustainable. Aquastore will take care of both our employees and our fish, giving a safer working environment and improved fish welfare. Maui believes in Aquastore to secure an increase in sustainable food production, to preserve and expand on the advantages of the coastline, <coughs> and ensure that salmon and seafood remains a top choice in the global food market. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. You finished in good time, so we can have time for questions. Hi, Jonathan Peck from New Cut, United Kingdom, my development office. Um, wonderful technology, great producing us lots of potential protein. What about the pollution? We hear some fairly um, nasty things in the news and um, reports from divers about pollution and plumes of waste underneath these fish farms. Yeah, I, th I think I had a toe-to-toe -to -toe with the fellow off Radio 4, uh, John, somebody, about, uh, he was a scuba diver and I was a scuba diver, and we were comparing stories of what we saw 20 years ago. Um, all I can say is it's something we need to manage. Of course, uh, being in higher energy sites, moving further offshore, not in closed locks, uh, is a benefit. The ocean does have a remarkable way of utilizing waste. And what we're talking about here is organic fish poop. Um, so we need to make sure we're sighted in the right areas, but also utilizing technology that can capture the waste um, and, uh, and reuse that waste. If I can compare it to terrestrial farming, um, I mean, I drove through Aberdeen the other day and I could smell what was manure being spread on the fields, which washes off the fields into the rivers and into the ocean. So we forget the same thing happens in terrestrial land. What we're talking about is organic fish poop in the ocean that we do need to manage properly. Hi, I'm Chris Graham from the Marine Management Organization. Uh, just a quick one about how, how do you feed all salmon? That's uh, obviously, I, I, I'm assuming they're fed with wild caught 
fish, which you say is sustainable, but how are you going to feed all the new salmon? Yeah, that's a good question, and it was one of my concerns when I started uh, 25 years ago. Uh, it was a very heavy fish meal and fish oil diet, uh, and your feed conversion was basically, if you look at your fish in, fish out, used to be more fish in, less fish out. That's different today. We use vegetable proteins uh, and vegetable oils to uh, uh, replace marine diets. So our fish in, fish out ratio now is about 0.73 to 1, so less fish in, more salmon out. Um, but of course, wherever we source from has to be responsible. Uh, IFFO uh, certified fisheries is all we source from. We do have two feed plants, one in Norway and one just built on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. So we're in the feed business and sustainability is important, but what's important about salmon now is there is less fish in to grow more fish on the other end. Okay, we can have another question, this one. Hello, Susan Gordonek from the Southampton Marine Maritime Institute. As you move into these higher energy areas, do you have challenges about anchoring these uh, structures in place or, or with site investigation becoming more expensive? Yeah, yeah, not really the expense, and, and, and the anchoring we have sorted, farms stay in place, what's difficult is to keep the structure on the surface together. Uh, you can see the wave action, which is why you can see two of the three concepts are to get below the surface, where it's a lot kinder below. So I think we've, we've got the anchor sorted, and, and uh, using a lot of, uh, of, of, of course, the tech that uh, oil and gas have used to, to anchor as well. Um, but the trick will be to take things from the surface below. Um, it's just much safer and much easier to anchor those systems. One more. Hi, just a question on costs. Um, the aquastorm concept, how does the capex and opex cost compare with traditional methods? Yeah, that concept, uh, just, just to clarify, Norway has a, um, a development strategy uh, offering free licenses to people that can develop new technology. Um, and you can buy those licenses after the technology has is, is run its course after a decade for a reasonable price. So that is based on having, I think, 12 or 16 sites of that size. You saw there were, were pods. So if you have the one shore base that's feeding perhaps a dozen farms, then you can make it cost effective. But there's no way you could run that infrastructure by just producing one farm for 3,000 tons. So you'd expect to produce about 20 to 25,000 tons through that one concept. Okay, so um, I think we should wrap that one up now. So thanks again, Ian. Thank you.